Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Is that it? They shouted in the Commons as our Brexit Secretary David Davis failed to offer any firmer details on the way ahead. The Prime Minister, Theresa May, had teed this up to be a moment, promising a statement that would, after weeks of uncertainty, set out the government's strategy for leaving the EU. David Davis himself promised his determination to get the best deal for Britain and a unique agreement, not an off-the-shelf solution. This may be so bespoke, so artisan, it could be years in the making. So tonight we leave the politicians and we return to the voters. What did Britain's 17 million or more actually expect to get from Brexit? And are their needs being met? And we'll hear from our own experts, if we're still allowed to call them that, who take us through what needs to happen diplomatically, economically and politically now. First of all, here's Nick Watt. Step one, two, three. This is the Prime Minister has told the world that Brexit is on the way but die-hard supporters are determined to ensure that the votes of 17.5 million Britons will be safeguarded. The government's chief Brexiteer appreciates the need for reassurance. There will be no attempt to stay in the EU by the back door. No attempt to delay, frustrate or thwart the will of the British people. No attempt to engineer a second referendum. Even after a 20-year absence from the government front bench, the man, affectionately referred to as the knuckle duster, knows that he faces a daunting task. There was no triumphalism, in contrast to one of his fellow Brexit campaigners who used the recent positive economic news to launch an attack on their referendum opponents. Does that not confirm that the 17 million people who voted to leave the European Union in this country know a darn sight more about economics than the members of the IMF, the OECD, the IFS and all these other squad diesel experts who have us on their face. I think that uh, he makes his point brilliantly, as always, uh, and uh, I agree with the main thrust of it, but let's not get too optimistic before we close the deal. Perhaps this cautious approach was prompted by warnings Theresa May heard at the G20 summit about the Brexit negotiations. But the Prime Minister's lasting intervention in China was her adoption of the central commitment of the Vote Leave campaign to take back control of the UK's borders while dropping their main idea for delivering that. What the British people voted for on the 23rd of June was to bring some control into the movement of people from the European Union into the UK. A points-based system does not give you that control. Nick Watts report, Theresa May finishing that off, and here to talk us through the implication of what's being said and what isn't being said. Nick Watt for politics, Helen Thomas for business, and Mark Urban, diplomacy. And we're going to break this up into four segments just to make it a little bit more uh, manageable. And we'll start where you left off there, um, Nick, and that talk of taking control. We've heard that phrase so much of Britain's borders. Where are we on the immigration thought then? Well, slight unease amongst some Brexiteers about uh, Theresa May basically binning that Australian point system that was one of the main ideas of the Vote Leave uh, campaign. Nigel Farage, who was the first UK leader to talk about that, said he was very worried about her language. But it's interesting, some of the Tory Brexiteers were more relaxed. I spoke to Ian Duncan Smith, the former Conservative leader, and he said he agrees the problem with the points-based system is that the government doesn't have control but he was slightly more suspicious of an idea that's doing the rounds in Downing Street which is perhaps you could revive the original attention, uh, intentions of the Treaty of Rome which is to restore the free movement of workers rather than people uh, and essentially Ian Duncan Smith was telling me I think you need a work permit system this is what he said work permits as a control process aided and abetted if necessary by the idea of a points based sifting system that allows the UK to decide do companies and do areas, do we need those skills here because we don't have them? If that is the case, then what we are able to say to companies, the UK, you can recruit from overseas to a certain degree and we'll let you have work permits for that. But in other country, companies, we might say in other areas, low skill perhaps or whatever, no, there are plenty of people here that can do the job. Free movement of workers, well, that's exactly what controls over your uh, work permits and your borders are all about, deciding who you want to have in 
Uh, but we control that. The important thing is we, the UK government, controls that, not the European Union. The other thing we heard so much about during that campaign was the spending commitments and the pledges of where the money would go. Any news on that? Well, I think we can officially pronounce the death of one of Vote Leave's main pledges on spending, which is that the UK would have an extra £350 million a week to spend because we would no longer have to pay our subscription to the EU. David Davis was asked about this specific issue and he said simply, my job is to give Parliament control of the money, no mention of any figures, but... Another Vote Leave pledge, which is to match the spending that goes direct payments to farmers. David Davis said that would happen, that would be covered, but only until 2020. Thereafter, that depends on the success of the economy. Uh, let's move on to more numbers with Helen now. Some very good economic data in terms of the surfaces. Does this uh, alter or, or shift how you're reading the economic data that's come from Brexit? Well, so the short term, the, the, the figures are still pretty good. So today we had this um, bounce back in services activity from July to August, again reversing the negative trend we saw in the immediate aftermath of the vote. So it does feel the economy isn't exactly booming, um, but those fears of an immediate meltdown have really lifted. But in the longer term, business just doesn't know where it stands. And while we haven't seen any knee-jerk reactions, um, there are problems. Businesses make decisions years ahead of time. So Nissan will be deciding next year where it's going to build a car that hits the streets in 2020. They will need answers about the UK's relationship with Europe more quickly than the government's currently moving. The other problem is, as the negotiations start in earnest, it becomes harder to manage some of those worries. So we've heard recently that passporting free access to Europe may not be realistic for the city. What senior bankers have told me is that they they immediately hear that and they start thinking about the worst case scenario. So the government needs to somehow manage these industries' expectations so they don't all hunker down and send investment elsewhere. And part of that talk now is the international trade relations. How did the G20 leave us, Mark, when all the photos are done and dusted? Well, I think the key takeaway from G20 in a way is that the wider world is interested in Brexit, but only so much. Out of nine densely typed pages, there are just two sentences on the UK leaving the EU in there. And this focus, if it, if it begins to wander, because obviously every country has its own issues, its own problems, is an issue. Because if, as it looks increasingly possible from the positions we're hearing from David Davis and others in the government, we don't want the so-called Norway option, mm. the full single market membership, we want access, then those types of consideration we were hearing about there, about banks, passporting, you're then relying on goodwill and nations basically saying, yes, you can come and trade here. It's much more complicated and questionable than the old car equation. They want to sell us cars, we, you know, where you can find acceptable terms of trade pretty quickly. Service is much more tricky. And uh, again, at a, a conference last week in Italy, the Ambrosetti Forum, where we were, we spoke to people there and we're hearing that passporting, that kind of thing, is far from certain from UK banks. Uh, and they just want Britain to get on quickly and absolutely spell out what we're seeking. This was the view of a former uh, head of the European Central Bank, Jean-Claude Trichet. After all, the UK is creating the problem. He's, he's shoot, shooting in his its own feet, uh, obviously, and uh, has to you know, be fully aware of the fact that uh, it is necessary to get out of the uncertain uh, episode in which we are. And of course, it is also the overall superior interest of uh, Europe as a whole and of the world uh, to limit the uh, uncertainties that have been created by this move. So that word uncertainty probably uh, not going away anytime soon. Thanks to all of you. There was, of course, no manifesto ahead of the EU referendum, no party pledging promises or policies. Instead, there was, you'll remember, a collection of voices from across the political divide offering those various scenarios of what Britain could be like if we chose to leave. So what in the end did people vote for and how do they think it's going so far? We talked to, here in the studio, Michael Keeble, a retired restaurant manager from London. Danny Chance, who's a dental nurse from Nottingham. Mick Phipps, a barber from Essex. 
Elaine Sullivan, who runs a consultancy business near Reading, Martin Bontford, a retired police inspector from Boston, and Angela Garvin, who was on our panel, uh, a PA administrator from London, and a warm welcome to you all. Now we've gone through the formalities, we're going to get to the chase. I'm going to ask you, uh, in a sense, for a show of hands, which of you would prioritise, as the reason for voting, this question of sovereignty, of making our own laws, being in charge? Yes, definitely. One, two, three, four, four. All of you, OK? So if I then said which of you would put as a priority, if you could only choose one thing, numbers in terms of immigration controlling the actual flow of people into this country, would any of you now change your mind and say that was more important? Well, I no. think it's, no. it's going to be... Mick. The numbers are going to be detailed to, depending on the platform that we create for businesses. I think... I don't believe that we, we need to reduce immigration. I believe we need to create a great platform for businesses to come here, create jobs. We might double immigration some years, pull it back other years. I think you just need to act on it a little bit more in the smaller sense, on the entrepreneurial sense, like a country acting on its own standards can do. I think we, we might find ourselves in a good position that way. Yeah, I, th I think, I think it's, not, um, it's not necessarily we've only got to take that number of people or that number of people. We just have to know mm. how many we're taking and where if we're the taking them. the jobs are there exactly. for them. Yeah. You don't, you don't so want to the, create yeah. Yeah, so we've got uh, a, a good um, infrastructure. maximum wage as opposed yeah. to the so-called minimum wage. Yes. So from what you've heard today, and you've just heard uh, from Nick Watt there, that the points-based system is probably not going to be the system that Theresa May chooses. Does that alter anything for you, Michael, in well, terms of... I think that we need a, a point system that is completely put in, in the way that we shape it. So when they dismiss a point system for Australia, of course, that's not the, they, they don't have the same requirements as we do. Mm. But if our point system could um, choose and pick and allow for ourselves, then... And, and adapt as well. And adapt. I think, I think it is probably more about the economic side of it. So it's not necessarily having X number of people that, no. have, uh, that have met that bar to come in. It's what have we got to offer those people yeah. as they're coming in and how are they going to contribute when they arrive? OK, let me mm. pick up with Martin, because I know that you were worried that <coughs> our politicians, you didn't have the confidence that our politicians would actually sort this out, even if it was a yes-to-leave vote, did you? Do you feel that things are going well now, better than you'd expected, worse than you'd expected? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the only thing I think is that the, the, the vote that we were given, that everybody was given, was black and white. It was yes or no. It was in or out. And now we're getting the shades of grey coming in and, and the grey areas. And, and I, 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 I just don't think that people were, were um, aware of that sufficiently. Do any of you feel that you were duped at all? I mean, you know, I know you've done all your reading, you've, you're, you came in this very well informed, but do any of you feel that you were duped by what, what you were told at the time that hasn't been the same I think, way? I, th I think we will, be, we will feel that yeah, if, I think if we at keep times, the, the, the single market and, and, the, the, and the free movement. The, you the, just... the information that you're provided with, I think, you know, I think everyone could say that we're duped into believing certain mm. things. It, it's always good to say, well, why? A, a lot yeah. of you have had a, a reaction uh, from other people to being Brexit voters. Um, Danny, what happened to you when the vote was to leave? Um, well, um, because I'm in the Labour Party and I was um, mandated to uh, be Remain, um, I was quite vocal about the fact that I wanted to leave the EU. Um, and immediately after the result came in, there was a lot of backlash that I received from... Um, not just people in the Labour Party, but people in everyday life, really. Um, I was branded, you know, as racist and, and things like that. And to me, immigration isn't a concern of mine. Mine's more to do with the sovereignty and the democracy um, and being able to govern ourselves rather than, you know, having to listen to someone in the EU. A lot of you are nodding. Did, did anyone else have that experience of being, you know, pushed outside or seen in a different way? Sovereignty of our parliament. But I'm talking about the, the oh, response yeah. that oh, people yeah. had oh, to oh, Danny. Right. Initially, it was a bandwagon that a lot of people got Top, on. Top. But I think to continue to still be in that place now, those people are not being optimistic. They're not taking their opportunities in a changing environment. They need to change. They so need to move on. So do you feel now that, the, as it were, the, the rest of the world has caught up. I, I mean, Angela, you were 
undecided right the way through. Mm -hmm. So did you feel very passionate when you went to vote and was it very clear in your head that which way you were going to or could you have gone either way do you still Towards think? Towards the end I was pretty positive that I was going to vote um, out. Um, I was undecided to begin with but the more I did the research, the more mm. I looked into things, the more I felt that we could cope and deal with um, our own believe, sort of, believe, or, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll have, I'll have a very yeah, positive, not? you know. Now feel. it's really interesting because <coughs> you're, you're talking about the sense of confidence and belief but essentially the big questions are still ahead of us all aren't mm, they of and one yeah. of them is this compromise somewhere along the lines we've all got to choose or our politicians have got to choose do we want to accept free movement which could be more people coming in that we don't have control over but it might give us that access still to remain in the single European EU market. Which one do we think is more important? As far as I'm concerned, I don't think I, can, I want to pay that price. No. The, um, the price of free I'm, movement. The price of free movement. Yeah. Who, no. who agrees if, with if it, if it means, now? If it means I, free I movement, then no. I don't think it will be, because I think, you know, I think being confident and optimistic about Great Britain, Absolutely. I actually think... I'd like to see a news report on the other side of the, all these other countries, the 160 that are not part of the EU, that going, we can deal with. Great Britain, mm. come and do business with yes. us. Well, that's so already started. We can yeah, have it all. Precisely. Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the things you've a heard, we probably won't have all. Uh, Elaine, I know you were very concerned about spending on hospitals, on yes. schools. That 100 million uh, yes. that they promised <laughs> yes. sounds like it's, it's not going to the NHS. No, no. Are you surprised? I, it didn't surprise me at all. No. Um, so, yeah, it. it was so what, eight. none of you believed that at the time? No. no. I think no. all those slogans were a bit poor. Yeah. And yeah. I think the it, negative it two over slogans were poor, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It washed it over spin. me. And do you politicians. think that the politicians are on top of this? I Have think they they're going to learn start? a massive lesson, personally. Danny? Yeah, I think um, no one really knows what to do at the minute. I think that's why everything is taking so long, you know. Um, it's going to take, you know, two years to come out of the EU. To be honest, I think that's, that's kind of right. Mm. Because we need to get it right and we need to do it well. So if it takes two years, there, there never does was that a plan, like was it? It's just a, that's just a figure in itself, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it was an unexpected. I, mm. I mean, if we're not coming out till, what, 2019, let's say? Oh, I expect to come out before 2019. I think, the, I, I I think, think Article yeah. 60 should be invoked in the first three months yes. of next year yeah. Yeah. so yeah. that there is impetus be behind our arguments yeah. Yeah. Mm. and that there is a framework on which we can that's expect that's, that's and build. Missing, there there has to be a time frame. We're missing a framework. No. We don't know what we're where we're, we're, we're waiting for the back-to-school timetable, aren't we? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much and thanks for coming in here. Thanks.